Happy New Year, everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today on this last day of 2022. And I got to tell you, it's been a really interesting ride here on YouTube. This has been my first full year on the platform. And uh, I'd like to thank every single one of you for stopping by and hearing what I have to say about the hobby, sports cards, players, whatever. I've learned quite a bit from uh, you guys as well. And I think one of the things that I really enjoy is teaching. And I never became a teacher. <laughs> I, I kind of wish I did. Uh, maybe this is uh, my way of teaching people. I, I'm not sure yet. Uh, in any event, uh, today I wanted to kind of tell you about a, a really interesting time in the hobby. Uh, kind of a transitional time, if you will. And uh, that is uh, 1980. Now, uh, this is the first year that the National was held, and that was on August 28th through September 1st. And that was held in uh, Los Angeles at the Marriott Hotel. We've had uh, Nationals ever since, uh, with the exception, I believe, of the pandemic. Uh, however, uh, in this article that I'm going to show you, uh, it's really kind of interesting because uh, at the time in, in the early 1980s and then in, in fact the late 1970s there weren't really any established price guides I, I think up until like maybe 1978 when uh, Dr. Jim Beckett came along with the Sport Americana and what he did was he um, established a set of pricing uh, through a mathematical formula which has worked very well up until uh, quite recently uh, when uh, the grading companies started and you know they, they kind of muddled the waters here uh, between uh, raw cards and uh, graded cards. And that's another subject for another time, but it, it has really been uh, kind of uh, difficult to establish a, a proper value for cards currently uh, because we do have these two separate values. Um, in any event, uh, in the late 1970s and the very early 1980s, uh, collectors were kind of complaining that their cards were being really kind of uh, unaffordable uh, to purchase. And you know, there were a, another uh, set of collectors coming into the hobby, which was the baby boomers. And... Um, they kind of uh, rock the boat, if you will. Uh, and so this this article is going to kind of uh, share with you uh, what it was like in 1980 to collect sports cards. And uh, I thought it was very interesting. So here we go. Collecting musty old cards, becoming valuable merchandise. Stillwater Evening Gazette, Tuesday, May 27th, 1980, by John Gilstrom, staff writer. After years of keeping it quiet, I've decided to let people know one of the deepest secrets about myself. It was a hard decision to make, but the pressure of holding it all in is finally too great, and I must release it. I know the public ridicule may be tremendously hard to take, but it can't be as bad as the tension created by hiding something I love to do. There are a lot of people like me, and our numbers are increasing as public acceptance or tolerance also grows. However, many of us are afraid to admit what we do. When we do tell someone, it can take years of explanations and examples to prove we aren't sick, disturbed people. The explanations and examples are needed even to convince your immediate family, but the time has come to let it be known one thing that I, John A. Gillenstrom, love to do. I collect and invest in baseball cards. You got it. Those two and a half by three and a half inch cardboard pictures of professional baseball players that line the candy filled shelves of supermarkets during the suntan months of each year. Every male youth I can imagine who has grown up in this country has collected baseball or football or basketball or hockey or all of them cards at some time in his life. You aren't a true American if you haven't collected baseball cards as a child. It is a custom prerequisite of puberty. Nonetheless, 
Once one begins to enter the clerisol years, his fascination of collecting Eli Garbus and Don Mossy is supposed to fade. Funeral services are held for the hundreds and thousands of rubber band bound packs of well worn cards. They are laid to rest in shoebox caskets and buried along with other memories collected over the years in the attic. The youth turns his attention to the opposite sex, buys his first car, and before he knows it, gets married and settles down. Or at least that is the way things usually happen. Not with me, though. After seeing an ad, the sporting news in 1971 that dealt with subscribing to a magazine specializing in collecting sports cards, I decided to find out if I was alone in my collecting desires or if there were others in this country like me. I subscribed to the magazine and have seriously collected and invested in cards ever since. There are so many reasons why people think I and others like me are crazy for collecting something that are, quote, only for kids, unquote. But those on the outside who take the time to try and understand the hobby find that we card collectors are not such a weird lot after all. Almost any collector who says he isn't in the hobby, at least partially because of money, is just lying to himself. Yes, I'm in it for the money. That's why I invest. It beats what my money can make in the bank, and it always has, even in better times. I used to be in it because I idolized many of the players who adorned the cards. I ended when I turned my life over to Jesus Christ. Besides, it's hard to look up to a baseball player who makes $690,000 more per year than yourself, and then turns around and says the 700 G's probably isn't enough to get by on. I would stop to realize that a person who works 40 years from the time he is 22 would have to earn $17,500 per year to earn the same amount as Bruce Souter will this season. But the basic underlying reason we all enjoy collecting cards as we do is the simple thrill of completing a set. The set can be all cards ever printed, nearly an impossible task for most people, especially with the rapidly increasing values now present. All cards printed of one's favorite player, team, or city, every card ever issued in a particular year, or all cards printed by one company. The list never ends, neither does the feeling. The list never ends, neither does the feeling a collector gets once he has accomplished a collecting goal. Collecting, no matter what it is you're after, is a simple, relaxing pastime. Personally, the last thing I want to do after writing and editing stories all day is come home and pump out more copy. I love to sit down, pull out a box of previously unsorted cards. Most collectors store their cards in numerical order and painstakingly sort them out all by number. There is no pressures for me to meet a deadline. No one critiques how I handled a particular box or asks why I didn't sort them the way I did or that, and no one can threaten libel. People are surprised when they learn who and how many collectors there really are in this country. My own estimate is that there are at least 200,000 serious collectors in the U.S. today. They range in age from 10 to 90, give or take a few years, and hold down jobs such as teaching, being a lawyer, doctor, insurance agent, or professional baseball player, precious metals dealers, and ministers. Many, if not most, belong to local collecting clubs where they regularly meet with others in the hobby to trade memorabilia, discuss the hobby, and organize conventions. One such group exists in Minnesota, the Twin Cities Collectors Club, which meets the first Saturday of every month at a meeting room at the Apache Plaza Shopping Center. The club will hold its annual convention June 13th through the 15th at the Burnsville Shopping Center, an ideal opportunity for all of you doubting Thomases to check us weirdos out. A chicken or the egg dilemma hit the hobby of collecting cards as well as other sports memorabilia in the past two years. Values of cards have absolutely skyrocketed, increasing anywhere from 100 to over 600% in some cases, and most people are unsure 
and if this phenomenon is responsible for giving the hobby its increasing notoriety of being a good investment and hedge against inflation, or if the opposite situation is true. Either way, hobbyist collections are becoming more and more valuable, while the ability to complete sets is becoming much more financially difficult. Many of the small-time collectors, mainly youngsters, are being forced to drop out of seriously collecting. To give a few examples of how much cards are increasing in value, the most prized card in the hobby, one of Honus Wagner, issued less than 70 years ago, has risen from a price tag of $1,000 in 1973 to one of $7,000 today. First card ever issued of Mickey Mantle in 1952 by Topps Inc. was worth $500 in January 1979. It has recently sold for $3,000 to collect every regular to collect every major regular baseball set ever issued by Topps, the hobby's biggest producer of cards today. One could spend years. It would also cost over $25,000 and it is a somewhat conservative estimate. There are too many aspects of this hobby to cover them all in one story. I'd be interested in answering any questions anyone may have and buying any cards you may want to sell. Just give me a call. Ah, that feels so much better. I've finally come out of the closet, so to speak, and it's amazing how much it did for me. I feel as if 20 cases of cards I've just been lifted from my chest. In layman's terms, that's a thousand pounds. It's kind of interesting, actually. And there are a lot of collectors who don't ever tell people that they collect cards, especially uh, collectors who are wealthy. Uh, they don't really want to tell people that they collect anything or what their collection is worth. Um, as I said to you guys, I use my collection to teach other people about a whole sort of or an array of different things such as the economy, history, art, um, sports, and uh, that's how I use my collection today. I'm not really interested in what my collection is valued at. Um, and maybe someday I'll sell my collection, but for right now, I'm having a blast. And uh, I'm having a lot of fun here on YouTube telling you guys about these stories as well. Um, the 1980s are really kind of interesting time in the hobby. and What's going on today, especially with modern stuff, this is nothing new. This has gone on apparently in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. Uh, the only difference, I think, is that uh, we're in a different economic situation than we were uh, previously. And it's going to be really interesting to see what 2023 holds. And so, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any comments, concerns, uh, I would love to hear what you guys have to say as always, and I'm pretty good at getting back to you. So again, guys, happy New Year's and have a good day.